Okay, there it is. Awesome. Uh, yeah, thanks, Ben, for the uh, introduction. Uh, first off, thank you all for coming to this first uh, edition of the meetup. I'm very happy that uh, it's such a great turnout. That, that bodes well for Vancouver Full Stack. Um, and uh, it's, it's definitely my pleasure to present on modern JavaScript here. Um, as, as Ben mentioned, I'm Jamin Holmgren. Uh, I am a local. I live over in Brush Prairie, uh, Washington, and, uh, and I am a co-founder of Infinite Red. Um, the, uh, so the, the, the topic that I'm going to be talking about is modern JavaScript. Uh, let me talk a little bit more about my company first. Uh, Infinite Red does React Native mainly. Uh, we also do React Web. Uh, but a lot of what we do is React Native. And then we do some, I mean, we have a whole litany of other things that we do, but mainly uh, Ruby on Rails. We do some Elixir. Um, we do some native code as well for, for uh, applications. Uh, and we've been around since 2015. I had my, my business before ClearSight for 10 years, 2005 to 2015. And then I merged with a company out of San Francisco called Infinite Red. And we became the new Infinite Red uh, in 2015. Uh, and then at that same time, we switched over to React and React Native. Um, I am the CTO, um, and we do a lot of open source, so I end up spending a lot of my time on our open source as well as managing our engineering team. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's, that's essentially what I do. I also do, uh, do our sales and, and whatnot. There's about uh, 23 to 27 of us, I would say, somewhere in that range, depending on if you count freelancers that, that work with us regularly or not. And uh, uh, we have a design team, a front end team that does React and React Native, and a back end team. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's, that's essentially us. We're, we're a fully remote company. So we do have a small office over in Orchards, but generally it may, might be two people there, uh, and they're not even working on the same project. So uh, it's, I work from my, from my uh, for my office in my house. Cool. Uh, that, so that's about Infinite Red. Uh, we have a Slack, uh, like everybody else does, uh, community.infinite.red. We talk a lot of React and a lot, a lot of React Native in there. There are almost 3,000 people in there right now. Uh, and uh, it is a pretty busy place, uh, but it's also not so big that you just totally get lost. Like if you go in there and post, you'll generally get into a conversation with someone there. People are very kind, very nice there. Um, we do have, speaking of React Native, we do have a React Native newsletter, uh, reactnativenewsletter.com. Frank Von Hoven works for us. He's uh, located over in New Orleans. He is our executive editor, and we post the most relevant React Native news there. So if you're interested in mobile development using React and JavaScript, uh, take a look at this newsletter. It's, it's very good. Um, and uh, as Ben mentioned, I'm uh, involved in, with the uh, React Native uh, core team. I, I, I uh, have conversations with the, the Facebook uh, uh, core team, as well as I'm one of the people in charge of one of the modules that we've pulled out of the, the core. So just a really quick uh, thing, React Native started as an internal. Uh, th this talk isn't about React Native, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Uh, it started as an internal thing at Facebook, and then they open sourced it. We've been using it at, at Infinite Red, and one of the things, it was very tough for them to stay on top of pull requests and things like that. Facebook. Uh, so uh, I, I extracted one of the core pieces out with their blessing uh, into, it's called React Native WebView, and it allows you to put web views inside of a, a mobile app. And then that's one of the things that I maintain, along with uh, another guy out of France who's, who's great. So um, yeah, so that's the React Native newsletter. Um, so this talk is about modern JavaScript. Um, and as I was uh, doing this, well, first off, let's talk about this quote here. There's nothing so permanent as a temporary, does anybody know this quote? No, it was Milton Friedman. OK, well, that's OK. I won't get political here. Uh, programming hack is what I'll say. Uh, so no, nothing as permanent as a temporary programming hack. And JavaScript definitely, definitely qualifies. <laughs> it was invented in 10 days by Brendan Eich. Uh, and it was intended to be essentially a sort of semi-throwaway scripting language for the web. But web developers got a hold of it, and they said, wait a minute here. We can make things that are not just documents online. We can make things that are living, breathing applications in a browser, right? Um, and 
this was before my time. I started doing web in 2004. So it was prior to that when JavaScript came out. But when that started happening, when it, when it came out, um, Microsoft had their own version. It was called JScript. Uh, and you know every browser had their own implementation and it was just sort of like a wild west, right? Um, so along comes uh, an organization called ECMA. I forget what it stands for. Um, it's actually not super easy to figure out what it stands for in a quick Google search, I found out. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but they, they named this thing ECMAScript and it's essentially a, uh, it's essentially a, a standard, right? A standard for what, what the specification of, of JavaScript is. What is JavaScript going to be? Uh, the ECMA, as, as we said, is uh, you know, the standards. Brendan Eich, who invented JavaScript, replied to someone last year and said, you know, everyone calls it JavaScript, including Microsoft. They don't call it JScript anymore, they call it JavaScript. The ECMAScript name sounds like a skin disease and won't ever catch on. So he pretty much put that down. Don't call it ECMAScript, but you do need to know that it's called ECMAScript for the next reason, after we get rid of ECMA and call it JavaScript. Uh, in fact, we'll call it modern JavaScript. Uh, and that's because you'll hear people talking about ES6, ES7, probably not ES8, maybe. But those correspond to the year, they don't correspond to the year, that's the problem, they're the version. They're before that was ES5, um, there was ES3, et cetera. But uh, 2015 was ES6, 2016 is ES7, and it, it goes on like that. Most of the time, you're gonna see people refer to it as ES2015, ES2016, and beyond. These are essentially, every year they release a new version that uh, has you know, improvements, hopefully. Uh, hopefully improvements on the, the language itself. One of the things to remember is that uh, not, there is no such thing as a full implementation of ES 2015, ES 2016, 17, et cetera. N you know, a browser that has JavaScript in it or Node, which runs it on a server or wherever you're running JavaScript, there probably aren't just, uh, we are totally 100% compatible with 2016. They'll have slices of it. They'll implement parts of it. So uh, no matter what you do, you can't get away from always looking at particular features, which I'm going to be showing you, and making sure that your, uh, your particular targets support it. So what we end up doing is transpiling. Uh, uh, you, know, you could call it compiling as well. But transpilers uh, such as Babel, that's the most, uh, most uh, you know, famous one, the one that's probably used the most, uh, as well as TypeScript itself has, their, its compiler will target older versions of JavaScript. Um, there's Buble and Sucrase, but basically these take modern JavaScript and turn it into a JavaScript that's older. So you, know, you, you might have a, a new feature, one of the features that you're seeing here, but if you're targeting an older browser or you know, any number of browsers, including Internet Explorer, uh, then you need JavaScript that it can run and it's not gonna have all these new features that I'm about to show you. So you would transpile. I'm not gonna show you about transpilers in this. I just wanted you to be aware of them. They're out there. Most likely you're gonna see something like Babel or TypeScript. Um, TypeScript does more than that. Babel also does more than that. But uh, those are essentially the, uh, the, the, most, uh, the most famous ones. Um, <clears throat> TC39 is another thing that you're gonna see. Uh, and you don't need to memorize these, but you'll probably, it'll, it'll remind you of the, hopefully something in this talk. TC39 is the community that is made up of Microsoft and Apple and Google and Mozilla and anybody else who is deeply involved in the browser scene or maybe Node, for example. Node isn't doing a browser, but they're doing a server side implementation of JavaScript. They all need to have some input into what features are being created. Because for example, let's say that we did something that, you know, added something to JavaScript that worked really great for Node, but wouldn't work at all in a browser context, or maybe didn't work on a phone, that would be a problem. So they need to have voices. They also bring in a few uh, invited experts, people that have dedicated a lot of time to doing JavaScript. Um, one example would probably be, probably be Brendan Eich. Uh, you know, he'll, he'll probably weigh in. Um, it's all open, and you, you do have some input into the process uh, if you want, if you want to be involved. Um, so my talk is going to be about 
the new features since legacy JavaScript. Now I'm going to, for the purposes of this talk, consider anything ES5 and earlier to be legacy. ES5 was around for a very long time. Um, and it's more or less what you would know, uh, basically what I started with, you know, using JavaScript way back when. Uh, and it took a very long time to get to ES6 or ES2015. Um, but I'm gonna go through what, what, what's new in JavaScript since that time. So there's a little bit of an assumption that you might know JavaScript up to that point. It may not be true, but I'll try to make it interesting regardless. Um, as I started making the slides for this, I realized how big of a topic that is. <laughs> so I narrowed it down to the parts of JavaScript that are new that I'm interested in. <laughs> so that's what you're gonna hear. I'm gonna mention some other ones. Uh, so there's, there's some other pieces uh, that, are, that are interesting. Um, but this is, you're, what you're witnessing is JavaScript going from that, that ugly hack that you know, originally uh, was intended to just be a throwaway language into something that is honestly becoming wildly the most popular, certainly the fastest growing language out there and being used for all kinds of things, including building native mobile apps, strangely. Um, <clears throat> so many of them. So let's just launch into this. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and, and as I go through this, there will a lot of times be examples of the old as well as the new way of doing things. And I'm gonna explain a little bit more about that. So variables. Um, previously in ES, well, really since the beginning, uh, you would define a new variable with var. You'd say var foo equals five or something like that. Um, var, well, it has been replaced. You don't use var anymore at all. Uh, you can still use var. They don't break anything ever in JavaScript. They, they try not to. Uh, anytime that they are changing something, it has, has to have pretty much a, not, a, a, a zero impact on websites that are in the wild. Um, so you've got some new variable scopes and bindings. There's let and there's const. Um, so essentially there was a problem with var. Number one is you could take var and then you could assign it, you know, assign a value to a variable and then uh, it, I'll show you an example in a bit. The scope could actually leak outside of where you might want it to be used. It, additionally, there wasn't really a way to make sure that that variable never got rebound to a new value. Now, it's a little different than what you might think of as an immutable or like frozen value. Th that, that's a different concept, but rebinding is what const is for. So, make let not var. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Is that original? Uh, one of my guys came over there. Uh, so, so don't use var anymore. Use let or const. So let works almost the same as var, where you, you could literally go through your older code base and replace every instance of var with let with one problem, though. It is limited to the block scope. It's not a problem, it's a, it's a feature, but it will break things in certain cases if you're not careful. So here's an example. If true, and then we, have, we open up a block, right? And we create a new variable, var name equals George, and then we console log it, and of course we get George. That's what we expect. Then we get out of that if, and we console log the name, and we get George. That means that this name lives on even past the scope that it was defined in, okay? Um, doesn't seem like a big deal until you start working with really big applications and you don't know what's gonna be further up the page, you know, possibly. And that can be a problem. So with let, we do the exact same thing. Let name equals George, console name, same thing. But if you try to console log outside of it, it will say that the name is not defined. Uh, so, as you can see, that is the difference. And this is why they couldn't just change the semantics of var. They couldn't just say, well, now var is going to do this now. Because you're going to break applications that are relying on this behavior. And that's one thing they can't do. They have millions, literally millions of websites out there that are probably doing this exact thing or something like it. And you don't want to be breaking those semantics. So you have to come up with new names, in this case, lead. Um, const works exactly the same way, except for you can't rebind it. You can't go and say now name is something else. Uh, it, will, it will fail. Um, 
at infinite red, we use pretty much use const unless we need to be able to re rebind it. Some people have different opinions on that and think that you should use let um, and because it's shorter and, and that's fine. Like use whatever works for you. There are also some new operators. Uh, so what is an operator? It's like the plus sign. It's, it's you know, like symbols that do things, uh, allow you to build and like manipulate data and whatever. Um, one of my favorites is the spread operator. Uh, so this is three dots, periods. And you'll see this in other languages as well. Uh, it's one of those things that once you've started using it, you don't really want to go back to not having, not having it in your toolbox. So let's say that we create two objects. We've got basic info, and it consists of a first name and a last name, and our employment information, which is company and, and job. And these are just containing strings, but they could contain whatever. Uh, and you want to combine those two things into a new object. So what you would do with uh, ES2015, prior to ES2015, you'd have to do like a loop and actually go through all the properties and construct an object. But in ES2015, there's a new function or a new method on object called assign and you'd simply, you would create a new empty object because whatever is the first object there gets mutated with all the information. It grabs everything from basic info, dumps it in there, everything from employment and dumps it in there and then you can just keep going. So I created another one right here, and I forgot a parenthesis right there. But uh, you get food and tacos and, and everything. Um, oops. Um, so the, uh, with the spread operator, we don't have to do this. What we can do is we can spread it. We can dot, 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 and then the variable. And that brings in all of the, the properties from that object into the new object that we're creating. And this is exactly the same thing, but it just looks a little prettier. And uh, it, this would probably de-sugar to this in the background if you were targeting something that was ES 2015. So that's a new feature in JavaScript that you couldn't do before, and it would take a lot more lines of code uh, to, you know, to, to uh, achieve the same effect. Um, and then this is the result of both of these. Uh, you, you get all of the different properties spread out among there. It's always last in wins too, so it'll overwrite anything that was previously in there. Yeah. Conversely to the spread operator, we have destructuring. So we were creating an object, a new object before. Destructuring is really cool because now you can pull, pull information out of an object. Um, so let's say that we have an object. It's a person. Notice we're using const here. It's, uh, you could use let. You could use var, but we're not going to. Uh, and we're creating a new object and it has name, hair, and height. And we want some of that information out of that object. We want to pull that out for a particular purpose, right? So previously what you would do is you'd have var name equals person dot name and var hair equals person dot hair. And then you could log it out and, you know, or do whatever you wanted with it, right? So uh, not too bad, but, you know, lines of code, you'd have to add more lines of code to, uh, to achieve the same thing. With destructuring, you do the const, but then you open up a, a new sort of block-like syntax here and give it the names of the properties. And those get bound to, the, the values actually get bound right there, equals person. Uh, so it does the exact same thing up here. In fact, it probably compiles down to that if you use a transpiler. Probably doing that exact same thing. So, but now we have a variable named name and a variable named hair that come out of the person. It's very cool. And you get the same result right here. Notice that we're not touching height in either of these, but we could if we wanted to. So it's only pulling the, inf the information out that we want. <clears throat> There's also the object rest, the dot, dot, dot rest. So this is the opposite of spread. Um, what we're doing here is we have, uh, th this is what we would do before. We would probably duplicate the person object, either using object.assign or some other method. And then we would delete from the new, uh, let me back up a second. What we want to do is we want to take this, um, this person, we want to remove their, their name but leave the hair and the height. We want to keep the hair and the height in a new object. And then we also want to have the name. So 
we're just deleting the name out of the new object that we had and, and we're also grabbing it there. So we have our name, we have the, the new object with the, the hair and the height. With, these, with the rest operator, we do the same thing as destructuring, but we just do dot, 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 rest, and it'll just grab anything else that we did not specify and put it into a brand new object that now goes into, that's called rest. So you can see that it's a, it's a cleaner, nicer implementation, and it's helpful in, in certain cases. If you just want to throw away a value, you could do that, or if you need that value, you can do that as well. Um, any questions so far? Uh, I'm going kind of fast here. And it puts all the, yes. Has the rest of the elements into rest. That's right. Is, is rest a keyword? It is not. You can name this Jamin if you wanted, okay. or whatever. Okay. It just becomes a variable that becomes, it's that new object. It's this right here. So you can, you can yeah, name it anything you want. Yep. So it's talking about foo, and then foo will be here. Foo, exactly, yep. And not only that, but you can put other ones here. So you have name, but you could also put, you know, height, comma, dot, 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 rest. And then that dot, 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 rest would only have the hair left in it. That's the only thing that it would have. Um, if you completed everything, if you took everything out, then it would just be an empty object. Okay? And by the way, these are very, very helpful. All of these are very, very helpful if you're trying not to mutate. You notice that in this one, we're mutating this, we're deleting a property off of an existing object, which can have, uh, it can have, you know, consequences uh, in your code if you pass something into a function and you're not expecting your copy of it to be mutated and changed. So these things all really help the spread operator as well as uh, rest and destructuring. One more question. Yes. So you said that uh, the rest will contain everything from where you picked up. So yes. You picked up at name, but if you picked up at hair, you pick up hair in the rest. Yes. Uh, or wait. So, no, okay, so if I only put hair there, uh -huh. it would leave name in there. Ah, okay. So anything you don't specify will stay in there. Yeah. Because they're not really, it's not really thinking of it as an ordered thing. It's just kind of plucking the pieces out that it needs. And if all you did was dot, 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 rest, nothing else, it would be a copy of person. It wouldn't be the exact same object. It would be a brand new object, but it would be exactly, uh, exactly the same otherwise. So that is a way to copy if you want to. Thanks. Good question. Any other questions? So a typed yes. test for equality would still give you false because there are two different objects. <sighs> yes. Because yes. If you use the triple equal. Right. Yeah. It'll, it'll, it'll say false. It'll find those two separate yeah. objects, even though they're identical in their content. Correct. And if you wanted to check uh, whether they were equal or not in that, you know, practically equal and not uh, perfectly equal, then you'd have to use some sort of like deep equals or something like that to compare the values. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good questions. All right. Um, let's see here. There's, so one of the things, this one's not a big deal, like it's not my favorite, you know, new feature that they added, but they're doing, they're also doing some things to just sort of uh, make your life a little bit easier, you know. Uh, JavaScript was, was missing uh, an exponent operator. There was no real way to, uh, not, with, not with an operator, you couldn't uh, do an exponent uh, mathematical operation. Uh, we had to do is call a method on the math object itself dot pow. Now I, I'm not I'm not someone who uses that that method all that often, right? It's not it's not something that I do every day, uh, but it's an example where they just add two two asterisks becomes the the uh, exponent operator, um, and so what one of the things that they're doing is just sort of bringing JavaScript up to uh, up to speed with a lot of other modern languages. Other modern languages have an operator for this, so why not JavaScript? Python has that syntax. Right? Same exact syntax, yeah. So they're, you, you're gonna, if you know other languages, you're gonna notice that they're stealing a lot of stuff from those other languages. Like you said, they're, they're, they're raising it up in that way. Exactly, they're trying to. Level of other exactly, because for a very long time, their JavaScript's sort of been a joke, and we all joke about it, right? Even, even those of us who use it every day, there's, there's something about JavaScript where it, it's just kind of, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, oh, you know, JavaScript. There's, there's a great uh, video by 
Gary Bernhardt, I think. Uh, it's called WAT, W-A-T, and look it up, it's funny. Uh, and he kind of goes through a lot of the sort of head scratching things with JavaScript. He is using an older version of JavaScript where there were more of those. A lot of those have been addressed. I do have a WAT in here at some point. Template string literals. This is one of my absolute favorites. I use it anywhere I possibly can. <laughs> this, this is the coolest. I, I really love this. I love this. There's an even cooler one next. Uh, well, maybe. I don't know. Uh, so name, Jamin Holmgren. And this is a pretty standard one. I was even with Callie here. I was showing her how to do this sort of thing with console log. She wanted to know what programming was like. And I showed her basically like something like this, right? So you have a string that you're assigning the name, and then you have console.log, hi, my name is, plus name, plus, and then you, the rest of your string. And a lot of times it's just punctuation or something, right? Very, very, yes, we've all written this line of code, I'm sure. Uh, this is a template string, literal. String template literal. Use backtick, for reasons I'll go into in a second. Hi, my name is, dollar sign, curly, and then whatever you want in there as long as it's valid JavaScript. Um, so it reads nicer. You don't have these kind of operators kind of interrupting your, your view here. Uh, so why didn't they just change the semantics of single quote or double quote to allow for this dollar sign curly? I mean, why not? It seems pretty, pretty obvious that you could just do that. Well, there were a non-zero number of strings out there somewhere that were using this and not expecting it to be evaluated as JavaScript. You know, maybe they were showing something in another language that uses the same, uh, same interpolation uh, to, you know, to uh, like display something on, the, on, maybe it was help or something for a different language. They didn't want that then to break and be like, this is not valid JavaScript. So there's a long discussion about it, and the end result was we need to use a different, uh, a different character and they came up with backtick. Um, when I first saw that, it was very jarring, and I kind of like, eh, you know, that, that, doesn't, that doesn't look right. But I've gotten so used to it now, no big deal. I'll even put backticks when I don't need to put backticks, because it's whatever, it's fine. Um, so a, a note about the name in here, you can literally write another JavaScript program inside that, those curlies. Like, there's nothing stopping you. It's an expression, so whatever the last, you know, value is will eventually get rendered into the string. But you could just put in, you know, a variable, which a lot of people, that's what they use it for, but you could also call out to a function, or you could, whatever, anything that returns something that can be uh, interpolated back into a string. <clears throat> Any questions about the, the uh, template string literals? These are very, very helpful. And as always, if you were to transpile this, it would turn pretty much back into this. So another cool thing about template string literals is this, we used to have to do this, or we still have to do this. If you're using a double quote, if you want to do a multi-line string, um, <clears throat> for whatever reason, if you didn't, if you if you just did a new line. Uh, JavaScript is, just throws up its hands like, I, I don't know what you're trying to do here. There's a single quote and then a, a, a new line. A lot of other languages don't have a problem with this, but JavaScript did. So uh, yes, there's the joke. Knock, knock, who's there? Very long pause, Java. Um, we got we to gotta make fun of Java in this. Uh, and you'll notice that we have backslashes at the end of each line, as well as backslashes around the quotes, because of course that's the that's the delimiter of the string, and we can't be, you know, prematurely uh, stopping our, our string there. So this isn't great, and I've actually written lines of code like this, and it's not, it's not great. Um, even if, yeah. is there? Yeah, see, that's how, that's how bad this that's, is. That's why that screws you up. Yeah, it screws you up, doesn't it? You had me going. Totally, yeah. It depends on if you, and the transpiler will choke on that too. Yeah, it would, yeah. Like so, if he wrote that, I bet you that half the transpiler <laughs> Probably. <laughs> so it's, it's actually escaping the new line. And, uh, you know, heaven forbid if you put a space there or something. Right. 
If you put a space there, it's gonna, you got a problem. Uh, so with a template string, they change the semantics so that new lines are no, no longer need to be escaped. They just work as you would expect. Obviously without starting it and ending it with a double quote, now you don't have to escape that anymore. I didn't have to escape the single quote either, which I didn't have to hear, but if I had put a single quote before and after, I would have had two on this side. And we also get the benefit of interpolation. And your backtick has to be on, the, on its own line? Don't, no, I could have put it right after here. So this is Windows or a Unix new line? <laughs> <laughs> Beyond the scope of my talk. <laughs> Yes, uh, so no, I, I just did that. I could have totally put it there if I wanted to. This adds an additional new line to my string. Cool. So those are very cool. Tagged template strings. This is pretty new. Even if you've been using modern JavaScript, you may not be aware of this, okay? So <clears throat> I kind of wish I'd done this, this slide backwards. This is my first time giving this talk. You're beta testers. so. Uh, but I'll start with the implementation and then I'll show you what the API looks like. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm just gonna skip through to the API. Okay, so look at this line right here. Console log, boldify, then backtick, hi, my name is dollar sign name, okay? So it looks like a normal uh, template literal, but this boldify tells it, go find a function that is called boldify, and pass in the parts that, uh, of the string, and it breaks it apart into hi, my name is, and then exclamation point, and also pass in the inserted parts, which would be, in this case, name, as additional parameters after that. Now, I'm, I'm doing a, uh, a rest here. Again, going back to the whole rest thing, you, I can name it whatever I want. I could have named this rest. This is in a function definition. We haven't talked about uh, fat arrow functions yet, but we'll get there. Um, and then what I can do is I can map through all of the different parts, so I would grab hi my name is and the exclamation point, and in between an, any inserted part, I output the strong, the, the, the string, a strong tag, the inserted part, and the other strong tag, and the result becomes hi my name is strong Jamin Holmgren and strong. So I can basically annotate the different parts. It, it gives me all this information, all these different parts, and I can do cool things with them. You could maybe build some sort of like uh, HTML rendering thing where you needed to add additional, you know, uh, divs or, or whatever to each part as you, as you insert it. So um, it's a very cool thing, uh, tag temp template strings. I think it probably comes into play a little bit more if you're building libraries. Like, hey, here's how to use my library use boldify and it'll just work. But this is a complete uh, implementation, I've tested it works, okay? So that's another thing that's kind of coming down the pike. There are actually quite a few uh, of these new features that are really more aimed at library authors than application developers because basically it gives them the tools that they need to build uh, DSLs or whatever that give you a more pleasant experience when you're using their library. This is, this might be ES 2018. I actually don't know. It's, that is ES6. No kidding. Okay. So it's, it is ES 2015. Um, been around a lot longer than I, I expected. I actually didn't know about this until probably uh, last year sometime. And then I never did actually use it in, a, in an application. <clears throat> All right. So let's talk about what the changes that have come to functions. Uh, the most obvious one is arrow functions, or fat arrow functions, or whatever you might want to call them. Uh, this is the smallest function you can create in JavaScript. It's just two parentheses. Well, you could probably make a slightly smaller one. But uh, a fat arrow, equal, greater than, and then two curlies. Um, <clears throat> so the old way, let, let's, let's look at this piece of code and then see how uh, the fat arrow function Helps, helps us in this situation. This, ha this happens a lot when you're doing things like building React components and whatnot. So we actually end up with an error here. So there's an actual problem with this code. We're creating an object. We're giving it a couple of properties, which are name and, and languages, okay? The different languages here. And then we have another property that has a function, which is say. Uh, 
And then what we do is we loop through this dot lengths dot for each. We pass into the for each method a function that takes whatever language it is as L, it binds it to L. And then we console log this dot name coming back to this, you know, containing object, likes whatever language was passed in. So it looks like it should work, right? It does not. It, when you say object.say, it says cannot read property name of undefined. Now if you're working with this in JavaScript, get very comfortable with this line of, or line of error message here. <clears throat> cannot read property whatever of undefined. Just means that somewhere this lost its scope. And it's not what you expect. So, so that was a problem because when, when we would have this function here, it would unset this, basically. And it was no longer bound to this original object. Notice that this.langs worked. So in the original function, it worked fine. It was the next function where it lost its scope. So we needed a way to say, I want to keep the outer scope with this. This needs to stay the same. Don't mess with this. So along come arrow functions. In addition to being slightly more pleasing in my opinion, maybe not in everybody's opinion, but slightly more pleasing to, to read, it also ensures that this dot name can, stays bound to the name, okay? Now there was a way, by the way, to bind that function to the outer of this. You could say at, at the end of the function uh, dot bind the parenthesis this, there was a way to kind of do that, but it was just kind of awkward, felt weird. Now this works. Jamin likes JS, Jamin likes Ruby, Jamin likes Elixir. And I ran that code, so I know it works. Notice that the say function, I did not do the fat arrow function. That's because I didn't want it to inherit the outer this outside of the object. I didn't want it to, you know, I wanted it to get the new context. So you're not going to totally get away from writing function, unless, unless, you, know, unless you know what you're doing. There may be some ways, but uh, you're probably not going to get away from writing function. There are places for both, and that's fine. There's no problem with adding features and then using uh, the new features for what they're intended for and the older features for what they're intended for, what they're good for. So uh, if you were to do this, it would then say this.langs is undefined because it's, it's now looking outside of the object. All right? Any questions about the arrow functions and the, and the scope that's happening here? I realize that this is a fairly, uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot going on here. Uh, the, this right here, it's actually an L. I should have written it out, but I was starting to get to the edge here, so I just kept it short. It, it stands for language. Yes? Um, if there's anybody who wants to fully understand this in JavaScript, there is a YouTube video about like, and this guy goes on for like 45 minutes about this, and the prototype chain, and everything about this, and it's just about this. Uh, remind me, and I'll post it or something. That would be fantastic. It's, I mean, it's like once you watch the video, yeah. you sit down and you watch it, you will understand. Yep. This. Well, you missed out all the fun in the first example of doing like, you know, bar self equals this and then passing it in as a parameter. That, <laughs> so that, that's how you would have done it. That's true, you could have. Uh, maybe that'll be in version two of my talk. Uh, but uh, just to recap, it wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't your yes, exactly. Just to recap, uh, you're going to post a link uh, explaining this in more detail than anybody wanted to know, probably. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Please do that. And then uh, he was saying that you could assign a variable uh, self equals this or something like that, and then use that internally in the next function to solve the problem here. Um, which is, that's what we used to do. And, Zach yeah. Zach and Wendell. Zach and Wendell? Yeah. Perfect. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, you'll see, where you see the, the arrow functions come in a lot if you're doing React, uh, because that's the one I'm the most familiar with, um, it's when you're doing things like passing an event handler. So like on click, run this function. 
is if you pass in an error function, the this that gets handed over to the error handler that eventually calls it will retain my this and not lose it along the way. That's a very common uh, newbie mistake, is to pass in a function to an error handler that loses its reference and can't call back to, it doesn't, it doesn't know where it's from. Yes, Ryan. I also find it really useful for callbacks that have more arguments, so you can drop the friends too. And the URL is the best. Sneak peek into my next slides. Um, yes, exactly. What Ryan was mentioning was that you, there, there are some other aesthetic uh, uh, sort of improvements that, that arrow functions bring, and I'm gonna go through those actually in just a second here. So another is explicit versus implicit return. So in Ruby, I did a lot of Ruby, and uh, Elixir too, I think, um, whatever's the last expression will get returned from the function. So if you don't wanna return anything, you would have to like put a nil there or something, right? Um, in JavaScript, unless you return, it will always be undefined, okay? So right here, we have function name, it returns the name. This function doesn't do very much. But uh, you can see you have to write return. And you also need to have curly braces before and after it. This is just part of the function uh, keyword. The new way to write this is you can, you can go ahead and just simply move it over and it looks exactly the same. It still has the, the arrow function, it has the arrow here instead of the function, but it still has the curlies and it still has the return. So you could just do that and that's fine, right? As long as you're aware of the, the this changes that that will, ha that, that will bring along with it. There, you can only do explicit, or you can do explicit with both the old syntax and the new, uh, new syntax. You can only do implicit with the new syntax. You remove the, the curly braces, and then whatever expression, whatever the end of that expression is, whatever, the, whatever it's, it returns, will get returned from get name. So, and by the way, you can also drop down a line if you want, if you just want to do a two line. I tend to avoid these. If I have to drop down one, then I'll put curlies and do an explicit return. It's just, I've been bit by this sort of thing before. So you don't need the braces? You do not need the braces if you're doing an implicit return. So this and this are functionally exactly the same. They do exactly the same thing. Um, this takes a name and returns a name. This takes a name and returns a name. It's just more wordy about it. Um, so I'm gonna show you another example as well. Um, maybe not actually. So. Ryan was talking about the parameters. So we have this name, parenthesis, arrow, and then the body of the function. In this case, we're returning whatever console log returns, which, spoiler alert, it's undefined. It doesn't actually return anything. Um, but we're logging it out and returning undefined, and we're taking that name as the one parameter. We only have one parameter, which is really common. It's really common to have functions that only have one parameter, and it just happens all the time. So you can just get rid of them, the parentheses. The, the parser can understand this, it knows that this is still a function, still assigns this function to say name, and you still get the name and you can still console log and it still returns undefined. Does that make sense? Cool. <clears throat> um, if you have two or more parameters, uh, then you do need your parentheses. And that is because comma is a, an actual operator in JavaScript. You can write like one expression, comma, another expression, and you generally don't, but you can. It's part of the language. Um, and so if you were to do a comma b arrow, it doesn't know if you're just trying to say a and then b arrow or a b arrow. Like it doesn't, it's, a, it's like a, a operations thing. So you do need two parentheses if you're running into this sort of a situation. <clears throat> okay. Um, Other than typing, is there a difference between having parentheses or not? No, it's just, it's just for Faster. visual kind of reducing clutter. Because t these tend to not just be, like this is a pretty clean example, you're not gonna see, it's obvious what's happening. But if you're in the middle of 
like other parentheses happening, you know, you're passing it into for each or something and you're, then you have extra parentheses um, or like an on click or something like that. You've got all these symbols happening around it and it's just the visual noise kind of gets to you. So by removing them in the majority case where it's only one, one parameter, uh, it reduces the visual noise. That's the idea anyway. Um, another advantage uh, to modern JavaScript is a trailing comma. Before, if you did this, it would be an error. Uh, so we are defining an add to function and saying, you know, parameter A, B, C, D. And I couldn't, in, in the past, I couldn't put a comma after the last one. And the question is, why would you want? Blame IE. Blame IE. <laughs> IE, actually. Oh, is that right? I actually didn't know that. Okay, that's interesting. Well, it made it into the spec. Yes, <laughs> uh, it made it into the spec. So um, why would you want to do that? Well, a lot of times you're like copying and pasting whole lines like this. And when you do that, you don't want to have to like, oh, I, or I need to re reorder these or something. Now the next one above it has, doesn't have a comma. So by doing this, you just kind of keep the commas all in one place and it works. Is there a last no element for having the last, having the comma at the end? That's a stupid error, was it? <laughs> I think JSON 5 might have it, actually. But you have to have a specific parser. Yeah, I think that the latest version does have that. Exactly. They also allow comments. So that's cool. Yeah. Uh, if you use a, uh, like a relatively recent JSON parser, then you can do stuff like that. But yeah. Um, let's talk about async await. So ES5 or ES2015, ES6 or ES2015 introduced promises. And promises were ways to write asynchronous code. code. There were promise implementations prior, like I think jQuery had their own implementation. There were a few others. Um, but they standardized it into one, um, one you know, standard uh, uh, implementation. So this is how you would write it. Uh, and it was nice because we didn't have this capability before or it would be convoluted. So there's a little bit going on here. I'll just kind of go through it. We have a function, get post count. You know, we're, we're calling out to like the backend API to figure out what is the, the post count. And what we're returning is a promise with a function that we get a resolve function. It gets passed in to us from promise itself. Promise will actually give us a resolve function. Then we go out to our API object, let's just pretend like we have an API object with a get user method on it, pass in the user ID that we got through the po get post count, and then uh, with a dot then, that's a promise, because it's dot then, Let me. I think if I hit space, yes. We have a dot then, we will get the user, and then we need to go out with the user and we need to get the posts. This is not a very well you know, designed API, uh, tends to be the case sometimes. Um, and we're also doing another then, and we're passing in another function, and we're getting the post there. And then we call back to that original resolve function that we got and give the posts dot length. And then we get it, and this is how we use it. Get post count, pass in the four, like user ID four, and then we get the count, and then we can do something with it. This is one of the more like simple examples, and, and you can see if you have many things going on, how this could easily start kind of, like you see this shape right here, like that? It keeps going and going and going and you just kind of get this choo -choo 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 -choo, all the way down your file. Uh, if you have like Atom or, or VS Code or something, that little mini version of your code on the right side, what do you call that, the map? And you can just see it doing that all the way down. <clears throat> so in order to make this a, more pleasing uh, and maybe a little more straightforward way to uh, uh, do asynchronous code, they introduced async await, and this was a blatant ripoff of other languages. So this does, I believe, exactly the same thing. Uh, user ID, const user, remember we got that user in the function callback before. Let me actually back up. 
we got user right there, right? Then user. Now we're just saying const user equals. So it just waits for it to finish and then puts it into user. Then we wait for posts, we pass in the user, and we get that back, and then we return the post.length. This reads like imperative code, just straight all the way down, right? Even though when a wait happens, it's going off and doing other stuff. And then it comes back and resumes once it gets the information that it needs. And then to use it, notice I'm not using a wait here. I can if I'm in another asynchronous function, but on the top level, I have to go back to the dot then syntax because top level uh, JavaScript does not support async await. They are working on that. And so that could eventually be uh, count, const count equals await get post count for. You could also properly use try catch with that. Correct. I'll show you an example of that in a bit. That? Okay, good. Yes. So, uh, so this essentially cleans up your, your code. Now there are some cases, and you'll actually see that in the try catch, where you may look at it and say, I don't think that's better. And that's okay, because you can still use the old, the old way if you want. So just, you know, be aware that both tools are in your toolbox. I do need an async keyword. If you just do a regular function, it won't work. It'll say, I don't know how to do this. Because what it's doing behind the scenes is rewriting it to the previous thing that you saw. It's rewriting it all into a bunch of, you know, like that again, right? <clears throat> and then we have the awaits. Those, those are the new async await. Now, there is a, in promise, there's also like a promise.all. You can await promise.all. So I have fetch A, fetch B, and fetch C, and I push them all into an array, and then I, I don't want to wait for each one to finish. I don't want to say fetch A, waiting, waiting, waiting. Okay, now that's done. Fetch B, waiting, waiting, waiting. I don't want to do that. I could, put, I could do that. I could say await, await, await. I just don't want to do that because it's going to take too long, and really B and C don't, don't depend on A. I can just fire them all off and wait, and whenever they come back, they come back. So using promise.all, I can await that. All three of those get awaited at the same time. When they're all done, you get an array back with A, B, and C. And those are the results. Now, if you do that, and Ryan will attest, he just ran into this. Uh, if you do that with 20 API requests or something, you might get rate limited. <laughs> Or actually, in, in Ryan's case, wasn't it uh, you blew up your memory? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so do be uh, careful with promise.all. Um, there's a really cool library out there by uh, Dan, Dan Levy called F Promises. F Promises? I think it's called. Um, and it, uh, it allows you to do things like how many concurrent at a time, and it'll, it'll wait and, and like only batch them at that amount. Yes? I'm still just kind of scratching the surface. Yeah. With promise.all, isn't there also a problem that if one of the promises uh, doesn't resolve, that it will, if, you, if you've got, uh, I guess, uh, error catching after that, mm -hmm. that won't work necessarily the right yeah. way? Yeah, there are problems with that as well. It's, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a brute force tool. It works in the majority of cases, but if you need more fine-grained control, right. you're going to want to use something else, like that F promises library or something else. Uh, another one is... Um, RxJS uh, and some others that, that kind of have a lot, lot more control over the, what, what, you know, asynchronous code like that. Um, <clears throat> so here's an interesting one. It's for a weight of, and this is a pretty brand new one uh, that I actually haven't used myself. But who can spot the problem with this here? We have an async function and we are awaiting on each promise. Can you tell what's going to happen here? Run it serially? Is... You kind of want it to run serially because you want to wait before the next one fires off. We're trying to wait on it. We don't want to fire them all off at once. Problem is that each function will pause, but you're going to have 30 functions that are all paused, waiting, but they're all going to fire off at once. So it's not actually waiting before it goes to the next loop. Okay. And this is, a, this is a problem with uh, async await. It may not be super obvious, but if you do the old school for, like the, the for uh, uh, counter, like iterator 
method, I mean, uh, statement, then uh, you can do this and it'll work properly. But that feels like a step backwards. It's like we have four each. Why are we doing four and like counting through and you know using that? So they they came up with for await, which basically does what we wanted it to do. It awaits each object out of or it waits each promise, assigns it to object, and you can do stuff with object once it's resolved, and it waits each time. So these are. Yes, exactly. Really? Of you'll see that, and I don't actually go into that much, but you, you can you can do more research on the the for of. Um, it's it's a much better version of uh, of the for uh, statement. Cool. Um, another sort of quality of life thing. Uh, I've done this before, where I check to see if foo is even defined. If it's not, then I give it a a default value, otherwise I use foo, okay? Um, and again, is bar undefined, then I'll use a default value of seven, and then other, if it is, if they gave me something, then I'll, you know, then I'll use it. And then you can continue on and do your thing. <clears throat> uh, with the new syntax, you can actually say foo equals five, bar equals seven, and it does exact same thing as here. It, this, you've seen this in other languages too. Ruby has this. You can just say equals something. JavaScript didn't have this, and so they, they allowed this. One cool thing is that you can use previous parameters as default values. So foo equals 50, bar equals foo minus 10. That's kind of cool. So if I were to pass in my func 25, then it would actually console log bar as 15 there because it's taking, it's taking 25 minus 10. So it actually allows you to do a full like JavaScript express, expression there. Who's gonna stick a function in there? I don't know if you can do that. I think you can, actually. I haven't tried it. Put a function in there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, uh, so that's kind of cool. Um, I, I've very rarely seen it used, but you can do that. Uh, let's talk about classes. So. I tend to not be a huge class fan, uh, but at the same time, they are a new feature of JavaScript and it's, it's a pretty significant one and it's used all over. Uh, I tend to be, I guess because of my Elixir background, I tend to like, you know, bare objects and functions. Um, so your basic classes, uh, we have a class rectangle, give it a constructor, you can pass in a height and a width, and then it assigns that to instance uh, uh, properties, and then so if I were to create a new rect, new rectangle, 150, 75, we've got, uh, I actually did that backwards, but yes, width and, and height there. All right, you get the idea. Um, if you've done other languages that have classical inheritance, this looks very similar. Now there are some differences underneath the hood uh, because it's still using its prototypical inheritance and everything, but I'm not gonna go into that in this talk. Okay. Um, here's a little more, a little more to this example. In this case, we're actually defining default values for these properties, height and width. It's very, very clean and like, you know, just kind of what you would expect, right? A constructor does the same thing. In this case, we actually define an, a getter. So if you try to access the dot area, it actually runs a function instead and returns that. So you can set, do getters, you can do setters. It's just set whatever, and then that takes uh, the value that you're setting it to, and you can you can save it somewhere else or or send it off somewhere. Um, in this case, we're actually calling out calc area, which takes this dot height times this dot width and returns it. So uh, classes do have some kind of cool things. You can also Quick yes. Sorry on that one. Yeah. Can you use the uh, default attributes in the constructor? So like width equals as the arguments to the constructor? Yeah, I think you can, yeah, yeah. I believe you can. Uh, and then those those get bound though to, actually I don't know, do those get bound to the 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 instance properties? I'm actually not sure if they get bound to the instance properties or if they're just local variables Got that it. you then use. But okay. I think there's actually a way to do the, the instance properties. Um, Beyond instance, you can also do just static things. So static means like on the class, the main like parent class. So app, static, app name, 
and static name. So I can just say app.name. I'm not doing like a new app instance and then calling methods on it. I'm just calling app.name here. Static means that. Before, what you'd have to do is like create an object called app and then do app.name equals something. This is just more, uh, more, more what you would expect from a class. And I am using, as you can see there, this and uh, interpolation. Um, there's a new one coming, which is this uh, kind of pound sign, hashtag, whatever. Uh, it is for a private uh, property. So if you don't want that accessible outside of, of the class, like you, know, you create a new instance and then you don't want someone doing the instance dot app name, then you put that little hash there. Uh, still accessible, but, um, but only two methods for that class. So these are just things that you know, Ruby has had since 1995 or whatever. This, this is just stuff where JavaScript's catching up. <clears throat> uh, again, inheritance, I'm not gonna go into this a lot, but you can extend other classes. You do have to call super. Uh, because you need to call the original constructor. You're overriding its constructor, so you need to call it. Yes? Uh, the first time I saw a class, this was like a couple years ago, right? Yeah. Um, I was told at that time, pure sugar. Doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't do anything that you can't already do. Mm -hmm. The prototype chain and whatever. Still true? Yeah. It is still true, <laughs> yes. Okay. Java developers get that's, for more Java. that's what I was told that it was for. <laughs> That is so essentially. JavaScript people. <laughs> that is essentially what it's for. I mean, it's a, you know, classes are a valid way to write programs. It's not like sure. you know, and they do. I, what I've found <laughs> I is. In my yeah, exactly. I uh, I've found that objects make the most sense when you're making games, and things that are very like object oriented. There's an object on the screen, so when I'm making games, I actually use classes because it actually kind of makes sense. It may, it works, you know. But when I'm writing web applications, I'm, I'm not doing that. Maybe if this was Vancouver game stack, we would be doing more of that. Um, cool, all right, uh, I'm going over time here, so I'm gonna roll right along. There is all the, there's a lot more to classes than that. I'm just giving you a taste of it. Um, new, some, there's some new methods, uh, so array.prototype.includes. Anytime you see prototype, that just means that when you create a new one, it's gonna add all these these uh, methods onto your new instance, your brand, brand, brand new uh, uh, instance. So let's say that you had uh, states, Washington, Oregon, and California, and you wanted to see if in states you had Washington, then you run your rain constantly function. Um, that is really helpful. I use dot includes all the time. It is, it's, it's great. What you used to use is index of, and does anybody know the gotcha with index of? Can't return a, uh, an integer. Yeah. Returns an integer of the position and negative one. Negative one. negative one if it's not there. So you can't say if like states dot index of Washington, because if it's at the first position, it'll return zero, which evaluates to false. false. Yeah. And if it's not there, it'll return negative one, which evaluates to true. Yeah, Exactly, yeah. yes. So, yes. Now, obviously, dot includes is probably just index of not equal negative one, right? Like under the hood, it's probably doing something like that. It, it's not quite, I went and actually looked at the implementation, there's a little more to it, but yes. <clears throat> Object dot values. Um, this is a weird one. I have no idea why they didn't have this like way back in ES5, because they had ES, they had keys back in ES5, object.keys, why couldn't they do values? That didn't make sense at all to me. Um, but they finally got it in in like 2018 or 2017. Uh, so what you would do before is you would uh, do object.keys of, you know, let's say that I, I had this scoreboard, right? These are my, my business partners. And of course, I'm way ahead of everybody except for Gantt. Um, I hope they watch this. Uh, and, uh, but I, I wanna actually like output a scoreboard. I wanna say name and then score. Um, and I, I need the, the values. So uh, object keys score mapping the key and then I grab back in this original score and refer to that index 
you know, it might be Jamin, and then it comes out as 42. So that's literally the whole implementation, in my opinion, of object.values. Um, now, you can do object.values, cool. I don't know why it took them so long. There's probably some story, like someone was arguing about something, and uh, who knows what. Uh, I do use that. There's also object.entries. This would actually be more helpful if you were doing the scoreboard because uh, it gives you both right here, right? So then you could, you know, console log. And actually, I think I put an example. Yes, I did. So object.entry score for each, and I'm destructuring an array here. So the first element is name, and I didn't, I could have put anything there. I could put foo or whatever. It would always grab the first element when you're doing square bracket and then you're destructuring. Second element, score. You're gonna see this more often if you're a React developer now with a new thing called hooks, because they return an array and the first element is the value and the second element is a setter function or something like that. Um, so you're gonna see this destructuring array positionally, not by name uh, more often. But I get the name right here and I get the score right there. And I loop through them and I console log, name has score, okay? Um, so that's what object entries is good for. Any questions about values or entries or any of those methods? I didn't know that JavaScript didn't have those. <laughs> right? There are always ways to do it, so you could, you know, use Lodash or jQuery in some cases, or, or uh, Ramda, but because they weren't hard to write, but you know, having third-party libraries provide your standard library isn't ideal. Or prior to that, prototype where it would actually extend the original objects, which was a real problem later when they decided to make, you know, real methods. Um, String dot prototype dot pad start pad end. Uh, so, how, does anybody remember a little incident called left pad? <laughs> yes. Yes. It was an NPM module. It was probably like three lines of code or something that millions of applications were using, whether they knew it or not, because it was probably some dependency of a dependency of a dependency where it would pad the starts and the ends of strings. Uh, so, and then what happened was the author of the NPM module had an existential crisis or something, and he just yanked it off of there, depublished the whole thing, deleted everything off of, you know, it was gone, and it broke everybody's builds. Um, <laughs> and, yeah, it was a long time. And uh, so, obviously it was easy to rewrite, but, um, it, it forced some changes with NPM where you can't do that anymore. You can't go and like break, you can deprecate, but you can't delete things that have been out there for a while. Um, and also uh, um, they, they created their own like standard library versions of these. Oops, I, there is one thing, warning with emojis. Emojis uh, use UTF-8, they use like two characters um, to, you know, do like a flushed face or whatever. Uh, so it can actually, you can have unexpected results with this. I don't have a solution to that problem, I'm just giving you the problem. <laughs> uh, Promise.prototype.finally, so this is our, our try-catch. So uh, you can, with promises, do a then and a catch, so if you get an error back, then you can handle the error. They added finally now, uh, so you can also run after either a successful or an unsuccessful promise. Finally, we'll always run. Um, and that gives you, you know, like, I don't care if I had an error or I got a success, either way, turn off the spinner, right? Like, we're done. Um, this is the async await version. So we have await and then we're, we're try, doing a try around our await. And this is how you catch errors. It looks more like regular imperative code. Um, await, handle response, my request. If, if that works, then it'll go to the next line and you can start using the JSON there. Otherwise, catch the error and handle it. And then after either of those, set is loading to false with uh, finally, okay? So both of those basically do the same thing. And this is a situation where I would look at this one and say, that's actually kind of, it's almost nicer, but that's up to you. 
<clears throat> Here's my watt. So what does watt return here? Try, return true, finally, return false. <laughs> what would you expect to happen? <laughs> true, yeah, it's false. So no matter what happens in try, even a return, it will always run finally. It overrides it. And if that returns false, that's what you get back. Um, I, I don't know. I, it, I don't really see like an obvious solution to that because finally it's supposed to run, right? And you don't want it to not run. It should run last. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if I understood what you said there. Unless it's iterable, like it returns a list of values. Then oh. Value what are the amounts returned to? OK. Yeah. So there is a real reason for that. If finally didn't return, would it return true or would it try? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Only when it returns does it override. Yeah. So, so uh, there's a bunch of stuff I didn't talk about. Um, symbols, which are used more internally in things, but you can use them if you're doing something fancy. Generator functions, which kind of, I don't know if they predated, I think they predated async await, and they be, like, async await is sort of like sugar on top of generator functions. We, we used to use generator functions more at Infinite Red when we used Redux sagas, uh, and basically allows you to suspend execution of a function and go out back to the caller several times. You can yield, yield, yield back to the caller several times. It's strange. And yes, so that's generator functions. Generally speaking, I use async await for anything that that needs, but there are some cases. Yeah, we have to use it in uh, mob x state tree uh, actions. Okay, so in mob x state tree, if you use that, which is a state management library, uh, then you may run into that as well. For of versus for in, as mentioned previously, octal and binary literals, big int, new number methods, more class stuff, mixins, typed arrays, regex uh, improvements, maps and sets are cool. Um, so maps would be we we used all our object uh, examples here. Probably could have meant maps instead, um, but objects are they have a nice clean literal syntax, so it's, it demos better. Um, but maps are helpful in certain cases, or weak maps. Uh, sets as well, sets you can only put one of a thing into. If you add it again, it won't, it won't add anything. Um, so those are helpful in some cases. Uh, proxy objects, reflect objects. So a proxy object would be it wraps an object and acts as if it's that object and can pass things through, but it can also intercept calls. So if you call the function on it, then it would say, oh, no, I'm gonna do something different. Um, Array from and of math methods, shared memory and atomics, uh, because they're starting to move toward potentially a multi-threaded model. Right now it's all like single core, single thread, everything. Um, but they may eventually want to go that way. And if they do that, then they're gonna need some way to share memory and do and like lock memory and stuff like that. I thought the whole philosophy behind JavaScript was to make it easy to program and make the back part of JavaScript. Yeah. You don't have to mess with any of that. So JavaScript isn't technically multi-threaded. It, it's it's still single thread, but but you're right. Like it it hides all that away from you exactly. Most of the stuff you're looking at here, you're not going to use it as an application developer. It would be a library author or something like that that exposes a nicer API to whoever's consuming your library. But these are additional tools in the tool belt. What does the mixins do? The same thing that like really mixins. I've never actually used them. So to be honest, I don't know. I would assume it's something like that. Yeah. I also did not talk, talk about TypeScript except for when I mentioned the, the compiler. Um, I love TypeScript. It's amazing. It adds types as well as additional other things to JavaScript. It is a big influential part of JavaScript. It is something you should keep an eye on even if you don't learn it. Um, so I did not talk about that, but it is important and part of the story. Uh, some more resources, and I'll make this, these slides available in the meetup group. A uh, whole bunch of stuff. Uh, one of my favorites is node.green, because I do a lot of node development. And node.green tells me what versions of node have what features. Uh, so I can see, you know, 
does, is there an array dot of in node nine or whatever? And then that, that'll just show me, it's a big chart. There's an additional one for browsers called compat table. So uh, that is it. Uh, that's my talk, so thank you all for coming.